The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. When you think about the phrase, the Holy Family, you just about always think of three people, right? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But you know what? Mary and Joseph had a larger, very distinguished family who initially were not believers, but they came to be very powerful believers. And two of Jesus' half-brothers became significant leaders in the early church. And I'd like to tell you a little bit of their stories. One of them is Jesus' half-brother Jude, who wrote that powerful short little epistle that's at the end of the New Testament, right before Revelation. His other brother, even a little more famous, is James. We call him James of Jerusalem, an extraordinary leader in holding together the believers in the tumult of what it must have been like to be a believer in Jerusalem. He did not go on missionary journeys far away. He stayed back at home to organize and oversee the work in Jerusalem. He also was blessed and inspired by God to write a short little letter of five chapters, powerful blunt instruction on how to live the Christian life. This is another in my series that I call Saints Alive, and I would like to celebrate with you today the ministry, the Christ-exalting ministry of St. James of Jerusalem. I don't want to embarrass any of you. This is the spot and in my message when I often ask for a show of hands, but I don't want to embarrass any of you. So I'm not going to ask how many of you might have fallen away from the faith you were given in your, uh, in your childhood, drifted away after you were 18 and took your stupid pills, as, as I did and many others, and then slowly drifted back in, or some maybe never drifted back in at all. Or how many of you were born outside the faith and became Christians as adults? But what interests me about this discussion is if you ever got so frustrated at the re-entering entering or re-entering a Christian community that you just wanted to chuck it all because it was such a painful experience. But this is a big deal. And I want to talk with you about that. And I've got some wisdom that has meant a lot to me from our saint for today. Saints Alive number two is Saint James of Jerusalem, or sometimes called Saint James the brother of our Lord. And I want to uh, dig back into a story that happened in the book of Acts. So would you take your Bible and open it up to Acts chapter 15. And while you're doing that, maybe I could just help you dial into who, who this James guy is. And It actually was Jesus' half-brother. And he seems to be the oldest in both of the lists that are given of Jesus' family, of his siblings. James is always mentioned first. When persecutions broke out in Jerusalem, the city almost completely evacuated of believers. A few trickled back in later. And one of those who never left was James. And he became, in fact, the point guy for the Christian faith in the city of Jerusalem while Jesus' 11 apostles plus Paul spread out and began to travel. He stayed put. And the Christians fled from Judea, many of them headed for the big city, and they're having some problems. We're going to hear some of those problems now. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses. Notice they at least said custom. They didn't say doctrine or, rule or law of God. They called it a custom. But unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. That was one of the key rituals of the Old Covenant. So, that brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas now were two-fifths of the leadership team at the rapidly growing church in Antioch, which by now is filling up with Gentiles. So there's, there's racial friction going on here too. This little Jewish thing now is opening up and all of a sudden the, the great unwashed are pouring in and the Jews are losing their homogeneity. This congregation was built off of immigration. We had to struggle through the same thing because if you're an immigrant and your worshipers, your Christian worshipers, speak a different language, you might as well put up big old walls to all the rest of the English-speaking larger city. Hey, this place is not for you. 
and you get used to this little huddle. And congregations have that disease, too, of turning inward. I call it the the holy huddle. They're talking interestedly to each other, but they're facing each other. If that is what a congregation looks like, they cannot possibly do their church planting, their people-changing, life-changing mission. They need to turn around, have their backs to each other, and their faces engaged in the wider community. And our congregation struggled then and still struggles now with that. It's so easy for us to turn into a clubhouse, isn't it, and only care about member needs. God called us to a far bigger agenda than just caring for each other, but to face outwards and remember how we look. Remember that sharing the good news is our number one objective around here, to go and make disciples. So there's sharp dispute and debate. They couldn't resolve it, so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. Now, that's the second time that's, that directional thing is mentioned. Isn't that crazy? If Antioch is up here and Jerusalem is down here on a map, what direction do you go to get to Jerusalem? You think you have to go down. But see, they viewed Jerusalem as this dazzling mountain that, that's the highest point in the globe of the universe. So whatever, wherever you're coming from, you're always going uphill because it just seems like that Zion is the holy city of God. So even when you're traveling south, you're going up to see the apostles and elders about this question. They didn't know what to, where to go with that. They saw how explosive it was. So the church sent them on their way. They traveled through Samaria and Phoenicia, telling the stories, made everybody glad. I'm going to kind of skip over a little bit of this, though I hope you read it later. Now, some of the believers, they're only half-baked, though. They belong to the party of the Pharisees. They just could not give up their rules and laws. Like, we're giving up our whole flavor, our identity. I suppose now you're going to say we shouldn't eat kosher anymore either, and you're going to lift the rules on the fabrics we can use in our clothes and we don't have to wear our prayer shawls anymore. We don't have to wear our yarmulkes. What, are you, what else are you taking away from us? You're, you're robbing us of our whole culture. All this, our, our ancestors, this is our identity. This is how we identify as Jews. You're taking all this away from us. What are you leaving us with? You're robbing us of, of our salvation. The Gentiles must be circumcised. They must be required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter describes his life-changing experience when God told him the kosher rules are over. Two chapters, no, more than two, uh, let's see, about oh, back in chapter 10, so five chapters earlier, uh, Peter and Cornelius had had an amazing encounter. This Jew, a Jewish ex-fisherman, had had this meeting with a Roman centurion and Peter was helped to see that this man was his brother in the faith and that the kosher rules were over. You may now eat anything that God has made. Rise, Peter, kill and eat, the vision told him in his dream. And a man's going to be coming to see you and he needs to have what you have. And Cornelius, this officer, could have bossed Peter around but instead got on his knees to welcome him as a brother. Peter says, now I'm getting it. God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Uh, Verse 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them. So I who have been blessed to be born a Jew have no moral superiority or do not have an automatic more advantageous place in line than these Gentiles. They are loved and valued equally to us. That was always the gig. He said, I never got this. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved. We're saved by grace, not by race, just as they are. It's, I, I get why these old, this old boy network wanted to do that because everybody wants to backslide into thinking that God loves us because of our performance because it gives us 
a, a lever to move. It gives us a chance to get involved and do something. We can improve our chances. We can increase our odds by our cooperating. And there's something sort of attractive about the idea that God comes partly down the staircase and says, I'm waiting for you all now. You've got to climb up to get me. And then we have to do our part and go up and meet him halfway. There's some logic in that, isn't there? Doesn't that make sort of sense? Except it's false. You can't even get on step one. Everything you do is so corrupted and rotten that it's useless as a basis for God deciding to like you. Left to ourselves, the Bible says, our righteousnesses all are like filthy rags. Should be thrown away and burnt up. They reek, they smell. What makes you lovable to God is his decision to love you. He decided to love you. He decided that you were worth saving. He decided already in the Garden of Eden, he mentally mapped out an ugly, horrible crucifixion of his son and was willing to do that for you and me. That's grace. It's 100% done. It's 100% God's doing. He comes all the way down the staircase, all the steps by himself, low enough to be born in the mud and chaos and dark of a Bethlehem barn, low enough to be flogged and scourged by people not worthy of tying the laces of his sandals, low enough that his deathbed was vertical as he bled out for the sins of the world. That's how low he went down the staircase to lift you and me up. That is what grace is. We've got to not talk about this, this ritual stuff. The rituals are customs and traditions. And they are getting in the way now of people's understanding of grace. The whole assembly became silent. Man, they listened to this. Listen to Barnabas and Paul telling about miraculous signs and wonders God had done among, among the Gentiles through them. It's like they're going, do you mean, wait, 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 wait. Do you mean to tell me that God loves them too? Do you mean to tell me we're no better than them? You mean to tell me that heaven is open to Gentiles too? Like, well, well we're the chosen people, aren't we? You were chosen for a mission, but you were not exclusively chosen for heaven. You were supposed to be brokers of God's mercy, not hogs of God's mercy. And James speaks up and says, now this is, finally it took me a long time to get to the point about James. Here's his speech, and listen to this. He's the old guy back home with the, with the, like the ex-Pharisees. He's got a hard job. He's got he's to help the homies, his, his, his homies in Jerusalem, he's got to help them get over their Jewish obsession. It's easier to do farther out where there's a lot more Gentiles, but back in Jerusalem, He's got the hardest job of all, but the lights go on in his head. Listen to what he says. James speaks up. Jesus, half-brother. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has just described how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. It's like, hello, man, we should have seen this coming. As I think about it, the prophets in our scriptures are full of references to the army of Gentiles coming in. Like, who do, what did we think? That we had a monopoly on heaven? Are we idiots or what? How about Amos? He says, take Amos for instance. Just after this, I will return, says the Lord. This is Amos talking now. And rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. Why? So that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name. Like, Dudes, it's so obvious now. Well, of, duh, of course. Now it all makes sense, says the Lord who does these things. Therefore, now heads up, here's the, the, the thrilling finale. Poke the person next to you in case they're not paying full attention because we're at the, this is ready for the drum roll here. I need a drum roll. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for people like the Gentiles who are turning to God. What a great insightful, beautiful way of putting that. I'm going to say it again. We should not make it difficult for those who are turning to the Lord. Ritual circumcision is not needed anymore. It's not part of the new covenant. The reproductive mission of the Jewish nation 
was accomplished. They did it. We thank the Lord for them and love every person racially or through blood connected to the Jewish nation. They gave the world its greatest treasure. But the kosher food rules are no longer needed to separate them. They've accomplished their mission. The rules about mixing different fibers in clothes, not needed anymore. The rules about having a priesthood and the slaughter of animals is not needed because the great Lamb of God has been slain. Now the mission is how best can we communicate it to the world and we should not make it difficult. I got five suggestions in closing for the so what of what this has to do with you and me today. As individuals, you are all evangelizing priests of God with a personal ministry and through our organizations that you are connected to through our congregations. We are corporately about God's agenda as well. And sad to say, I'm afraid we sometimes make it difficult for people. Just take one little thing like accessibility of your building. Man, I love our ancestors who built this building, but apparently nobody back in 1914 ever limped, needed a wheelchair, or used a cane because you had to climb a lot of steps to get in here. Secondly, I don't think anybody ever had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> they, you're supposed to, their mothers told you to go at home before you left and then hold it till you got back home because our bathrooms were impossible to find and once you found them, you wish you hadn't. <laughs> they were down in a dungeon and, and, the, and with, with, a common, with, with no separate walls, the men's and women's areas were kind of like common and it, it, it was really bad. Think about people whose legs don't work quite as well as yours. Are we paying attention to the accessibility of people who have mobility issues, who don't hear well, who don't see well? Does, this, does the experience that we offer, is it, is it putting obstacles in the way of some people? Think about that and look around you and just think about that. Second, how people are treated is the number one predictor of whether they'll ever come back are you so into enjoying a few friends here that you like hanging around with, you don't even notice the invisible woman four feet away from you whose heart is breaking because she's lonely and miserable and is hoping somebody will notice her? The new people don't have enough courage and strength to walk around like a salesperson at a shoe salesman convention. Hey, how are you doing? I'm blah, 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 blah. They're wounded. As anybody without confidence in Jesus is wounded, they need you to take the first step. They need you to notice them. Do you see the people around you struggling to figure out where they are in the, in the hymn book or in a Bible? Don't just say, well, uh, first of all, do you notice? And second, if you do, don't just think, yeah, I remember when I used to have trouble groping around in it. Help them. People, the way people were treated by the other people is the number one predictor of whether they'd ever show up again. And you and I have a solemn and sacred mission not to look past people or through them, over them, around them, but to look them in the face and say, Hi, my name's Mark. I'm glad you're here. Tell me your name. Where's home for you? Where are you from? Tell me, is your family here with you today? What do you do? Get, ask them. Make a connection as human beings. Uh, third thing, I need you to hold me accountable that the teaching that goes on here is not just geared for the advanced Christians. And I think about you advanced ones. If you've been going to church for 50, 60 years, you've heard all the basic stuff. And, and you're, I don't want you to get bored. You need something to engage your mind at advanced level. And I want to I make sure another time I'll... I'll urge you to push on me to make sure there's good meat out there for those of you with good teeth. But there's some spiritual children there too that need milk. And I need you to hold me accountable that our talk here is accessible, as accessible to a first-time attender as it is to the, the old boy and old girl network. Okay? Does that make sense? Not if you get what I'm saying. Make sure that we create an experience and environment where a first-time stray, one of God's wounded strays, wanders in and has a chance to connect. Number four, our particular tribe loves history, and you know I do too. I'm fascinated by it. Do you know the problem 
with really learning the lessons well of the past, you know there's a big problem with that and a big risk, is that sometimes you, you turn around so much to look backwards, you get a crick in your neck and you can't stop. And you end up spending more time looking in the rear view than in the windshield. This congregation has been around since 1875. We've got to make certain that the traditions and baggage that we've accumulated still have relevance today. That they still matter. That we don't do stuff just because we've always done that. Everything's got to have a why. How does this help? How does this, why does this make sense? Because all of the traditions and stuff are all optional baggage. And we've got to be careful because sometimes that old baggage becomes an obstacle for new people. What would James tell us? We do not want to make it difficult for people who are turning to Christ. Last of all, challenge number five is this. When you dare to talk to somebody who's been away from God for a while or maybe never been close with God, you will see things about the way they talk. Maybe their language is really salty. You'll see things about their alcohol or maybe their drug use that you think is, is over the top. You'll see things about their, the way they live out their sexuality. Might be living together without being married or have a string of boyfriends or girlfriends that they shack up with casually. Or maybe they're caught up in the gay life and, you, you, uh, and that's what catches your eye. So you start working on that first and it's like you try to clean people up first and, and, and say like, well, you've got to stop cussing and then God will like you. Or you've got you to gotta get married to your girlfriend then God will like you. That's backwards kind of talk. People who are not receiving steadily the word of God to encourage their heart and educate their mind can't clean themselves up any more than an alcoholic can simply decide, well, tomorrow I guess, I guess it is kind of dumb, I'm going to stop drinking tomorrow. What is it? Principle number three in Alcoholics Anonymous is you are powerless. You need a support team to help you through this. You can't clean up yourself. You need a team. That's why people with drinking problems have got to go to their meetings because you need an accountability team. Lead with the gospel. Before you lay on people the rules of how you ought to be living, leave that till a later time. What matters first is that we project gospel, which means you are valuable to God. That makes you valuable to me. Second, God unconditionally loves you, and I do too. Unconditionally means no conditions, no fingers crossed, no, I will love you when, I love you now as is. God forgives you 100% and so do I. Nobody can do anything to change his or her lifestyle unless they are fully dialed into the power that comes from the gospel and the wisdom that comes from the word. But they won't start doing that on their own. They have to be loved into it. And finally, what matters is not the degree of how much you or I or this group can change other people's behaviors what matters primarily is to help the Word of God do its wonderful miracle of turning them into believers. For when people have Christ in their hearts and His Word coming into their ears, anything is possible and God will transform people by His power, not yours, not mine. So in the way in which you talk to people as individuals and in the way that we build our culture as a congregation, always, always remember, Lead with the gospel, gospel first, and we'll worry about the rules later. Why? Because we do not, can you say it with me? We do not want to make it difficult for people who are turning to Christ. Say it with me one more time. We do not want to make it difficult for people who are turning to Christ. Amen.
Ever since its beginning, Time of Grace has been nothing but a miracle. It started small on one TV station, now has a reach throughout the country, and even increasingly in many places throughout the world. And not only in English, but increasingly our literature is being translated into other languages as well. There is a big reason why that's happening. The reason is to thank all of you who have become Grace Partners. With your generous gifts, you have caused this tremendous growth so that Time of Grace's gospel message can be heard throughout the world. If you have not recently made your own financial contribution to Time of Grace, let me ask you today to pray and consider your best gift. I would love to have you on the team and be one of my Grace Partners. I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment. We have an important opportunity to put before you today. It's one that will put the gospel within reach of even more people around the world. One of the greatest needs that friends in other countries continue to share with us is the need for Christian living devotionals. There just isn't a lot of material that applies God's Word to everyday life. That's why our devotionals are perfect for translating. We're currently translating them into Spanish, Mandarin, and Japanese, but want to reach even more people including speakers of Brazilian, Portuguese, and Korean. I'm asking for your best gift today so that we can translate these materials and share the gospel in more ways and even more languages. As a thank you for your gift, I'd love to send you some of these same devotionals that are being read around the world. This is my Freedom from Fear and Anxiety devotional set. As you're encouraged by these devotionals, be reminded that your support is helping to put them in the hands of people all over the world. Here's how to give and to request your booklets. To receive the Freedom from Fear and Anxiety devotional set, text the word TIME to 313131, call 800-661-3311, or visit timeofgrace.org slash store. Let's offer a prayer today, shall we? Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of leaders like James of Jerusalem, leaders who at risk to their own lives stay in even very stressful and difficult situations. Thank you also for his leadership in helping the early church to overcome some of its fears and prejudices and to have a true missional outreach spirit, even among the old line congregations. May James's powerful words of joyful and active Christian living inspire and bless Christians today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske. Every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, You'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching. And join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.